So you've asked for it. Today's video is about Tesla Dojo. What's your minimum specification? So one of the best things in the semiconductor industry this decade is the depth and breadth of chip startups and innovation. Not only are there new ideas taking hold, funded by venture capital and hundreds of millions of dollars, but the big players in compute heavy verticals have created their own chip design teams to create something that caters specifically to their own needs, rather than rely what al on what already exists in the market. Tesla, the electric vehicle manufacturer leading the way in autonomous driving, has poured what is presumably billions into developing a new machine learning computer that couldn't have existed in the market any other way. Today, we go through what it is, how it is built, and why Tesla had to go down this route to design it. But first, a word from our sponsor. If you like this content and you'd much rather have a written version, head on over to my newsletter. Newsletter posts about once or twice a week, and the idea is that it covers the scripts of the videos that you may or have already seen. It has some scripts of videos that I never got around to recording, some analysis of the financial markets of the semis. A lot of you have been asking for a written version of my work. So here you go. The more the more Substack newsletter. Two of the key elements to building a fully autonomous self-driving vehicle are the brain and the algorithm. The brain is the speed, while the algorithm enables both the accuracy and the features. The algorithm needs to be trained and optimized offline in a big data center with lots and lots of data before it's given to the brain of the car. The two key words here are training and inference. In the data center, the algorithm is trained. It takes lots of labeled data and attempts to predict the best course of action within that data. Over millions of hours of video, billions of hours of compute, the output is an algorithm, a series of calculations with the right numbers that can take the new data and get the right result. When that trained algorithm is put to use, where it isn't training but working after it is trained, we call that inference. It infers the results with new data. Training is long and complex, but with known data, and inference works on a trained algorithm with new data, where the exact result is determined by the trained algorithm. Tesla's self-driving car, conceptually, feels like it just has to have the algorithm, but in reality, there are probably hundreds of trained neural networks for different elements, each working on new data and continually being updated back in the data center, and updated versions of the algorithm are sent over the air with updates. There are a number of limits to training a neural network, raw data, software, time, power, and at some level you can speed it up by throwing more computer hardware at it to make training faster. But if you increase the number of GPUs to do that training by 10x, then another 10x, then another 10x, there comes a point where the more you buy, the less time you save. At last year's Tesla AI Day, Elon Musk stated that the GPUs that they could buy to do this work could do it, but the requirements in cost and time were astronomical. But the, the, the asset test here, and, and um, you know, what I've told, told the Dojo team is, like, it's, it's, it's successful if the uh, software team wants to turn off the GPU cluster. But if they want to keep the GPU cluster on, <laughs> it's not successful. <laughs> so, yeah. In order to get their self-driving system to work, they had to build their own hardware in which we enter Dojo, the brand name for Tesla's new hardware focused on training neural networks through machine learning. Dojo is a broad name, as it refers to a number of things in what we're about to talk, to the, talk about today. Almost all the fun stuff here is something called Tesla Dojo something. So we're going to start from the bottom, from the most basic design element, a Dojo processing core, all the way up to the Dojo supercomputer. Well, actually a lie. I'm going to actually start at the chip level and something called the Dojo D1. The Dojo D1 is a 645 square millimeter silicon die built on TSMC's 7 nanometer process. 645 square millimeters is a very big chip as big as massive server chips and almost as big as the biggest GPUs. There are three elements to the Dojo D1 chip, the cores, the onboard interconnect, and the connections to other chips. Starting with the cores, and there are 354 of them per D1 chip. Normally, when we speak about big AI chips in this industry, we are not looking at cores, but repeated vector units like a GPU. There ends up being a global scheduler to manage the data, and all the magic to process machine learning mathematics is governed by blocks that do the same operations across multiple bits of data. 
by reducing the control to one focus point. That saves die area and you get a lot more units at the expense of configurability. On the other side, a big CPU could have 64 cores and each core can run different mathematics completely, but it can be inefficient if you want them all to work on the same data with the same operations together. Tesla here has gone for something that's kind of in the middle. Unlike many AI chips coming to market, the smallest irreducible Tesla D1 Dojo D1 process unit is the core. Not a compute unit, not a vector array, but a fully fledged core. The core is, compared to a normal CPU, actually very simple, but it's still a core. It has its own local SRAM, a dedicated interface to a wide network, and it doesn't care what other cores are doing around it. It has rudimentary branch prediction for fetch buffers, two decode units, Scalar schedulers, scalar register files, two address generator units, two arithmetic logic units, a vector scheduler, a vector register file, a SMD data path, and four 8x8 eight eight matrix multiply units. On the scalar side, the risks, the instruction sets looks like a RISC-V implementation, but the vector side is custom for machine learning. Clam from Chips and Cheese has said the core handle is more like IBM's cell processor in the PS3 than a traditional CPU core that we're perhaps used to. The core uses a four-way simultaneous multi-threading, and Tesla say, is saying that usually one or two threads are running compute, whereas the other one or two threads are managing data flow. The core has a 32-byte fetch window, holding up to eight instructions from a small instruction cache, and each decode unit can decode up to four instructions across two threads per cycle. The integer side is a four-wide with an eight-byte load and eight-byte store, while the vector side is two-wide, but with two 64-byte load and one 64-byte store. This is direct into the execution ports provided by explicit transfer instructions. The core is designed to be light, so there are limited protection mechanisms here to stop threads interfering with each other as there would be on modern user cores. This is simply because Tesla knows its own workload, and for now, they're the only ones going to use this hardware. Resources between the threads are managed by the compiler, which also means resource management to the 1.25 megabytes of SRAM per core. There are no L1 or L2 data caches here. Everything goes through SRAM. So it's not like a cache, but uses DMA operations. It should be noted that any access to the SRAM flushes the instruction cache rather than an explicit coherency mechanism. As the SRAM isn't an explicit cache in of itself, it also means that tag and state bits aren't stored, saving space, but also removes load latency at the expense of some code complexity. In reality, this means the 1.25 megabytes of SRAM can have an L1 cache-like latency somewhere around four to six cycles as an estimate. That SRAM is capable of 400 gigabytes per second load or 270 gigabytes per second store and has a built-in gather engine at the eight and 16 byte granularity for the vector side of the core. A list parser also assists the eight wide decode engine, enabling certain instructions to execute in the front end and drop early while maintaining a high throughput. While the core has access to the SRAM, so does the on-chip network, and each core has a network on-chip or NOC router that communicates to the other cores on the chip. Data, data can come from the rest of the network and rather go through the core to wait to be placed into the SRAM. The router can do it itself at 64 bytes per cycle read or write with a direct memory access or DMA. That NOC router can communicate to the four other NOC routers up, down, left, and right, at 128 bytes per cycle in each direction, both send and receive. What's interesting here is that Tesla stated last year at AI Day that the core was designed based on the physical limits of the NOC router and on-chip network. They wanted to ensure that core-to-core -core communication from NOC to NOC occurred in only one cycle, so that puts a physical limit on the design. So because Tesla knows what it wants to run on these cores, the full data path is designed around the specific ways that the numbers are represented in binary. Whole numbers are integers, whereas fractions are represented in it by what we call floating point formats. And there are special machine learning floating point formats not commonly used in regular CPUs or GPUs. It probably wants a, warrants a special video on quantization, but Tesla here is focusing on FP32, BF16, CFP8 and CFP16, as well as a few other formats each of them varying in the range of numbers represented as well as their accuracy. There are special instructions here to deal with those formats that Tesla has developed, as well as a Tesla Dojo instruction set just for this chip. So that's the core and the internal interconnect. Let's go back up to the higher level and that Dojo D1 die. That's the chip at the heart of all this. As I mentioned previously, 
This chip is 645 square millimeters and has 354 of those cores we just talked about on the chip arranged in a 2D array. Each core has the SRAM, a NOC, and in total we have 440 megabytes of SRAM per D1 chip. On the edge of the chip is the external communication hardware, a custom low power SIRDES link that Tesla has developed themselves. A SIRDES link is a serializer deserializer and just a technology that allows data in a chip to be transferred with fewer wires and fewer connections, making it less complicated. Most off-chip connections on your regular computer will be SIRDES links, such as the AMD Infinity Fabric chiplet links or PCIe links. Tesla here has covered all four edges of its chips with these links, 576 bi-directional channels of them, leading to a total of 8 terabytes per second connectivity or 2 terabytes per second on each edge. Should be noted that last year Tesla claimed 4 terabytes per second per edge, but this seems to have halved. There's uh, probably some power involved in that decision. That's the three things that make up the Tesla Dojo D1 chip. The core, the on-chip network, and the off-chip connectivity. Now we have to think bigger and how these D1 chips are laid out together, and this is kind of where the magic really happens. Tesla designs the chips, they get sent to TSMC to be manufactured, and then they are tested. The ones that pass the tests, the ones that can do the work at the frequency and voltage required, are, are called known good die. The ones that don't work are put to the side, at least for the moment. Tesla and TSMC then take 25 of those known good chips and arranges them in a 5x5 five five square and puts them on a massive silicon interposer to create what we call a dojo training tile. We'll be talking about tiles a lot for the rest of this video, so it's worth taking this in. A tile is almost as big as a silicon wafer. In fact, TSMC calls this technology chip on wafer technology. Those 25 known good D1 chips are placed on the big interposer in that 5x5 five five grid and the interposer manages the power for each of the D1 chips as well as the chip to chip connectivity. All those SIRDES links I was mentioning earlier, each of those 25 chips are talking to its nearest neighbors at two terabytes per second each. All of the chips, the big interposer, all that data also needs to be managed with power and thermal requirements. A full 25 chip dojo training tile uses unique packaging as the full power of one tile is around 15 kilowatts that's at 18,000 amps, which means a voltage of around 0.83 volts. If a modern GPU is 400 watts, then this is essentially 40 of those GPUs all in one package. This actually means that each one of those D1 chip, 25 D1 chips are around 550 watts, depending on whether the connectivity power is measured as part of the chip or not. Normally with a chip, the manufacturer has to deal with communication and power in the same dimension, but here, Tesla are able to focus connectivity across a dojo tile horizontally and power vertically. The power comes up from the bottom of the interposer, while the casing around it, on the top, and technically the bottom, deals with the cooling. Something very familiar happens with what Cerebrus has at over 20 kilowatts, so it's not a completely new technology, but it will still be bespoke for this solution. So now we have this big tile with 25 D1 chips, 8,850 Dojo D1 cores, and 11 gigabytes of SRAM. In terms of compute, each tile is rated at 9 petaops of BF16 machine learning performance. Because of all the 5x5 grid array of D1 chips having off-chip connectivity, a single one of these large tiles has 18 terabytes per second for tile-to-tile -tile connectivity. Yep, that's right. Not only can you have 25 chips for tile, but you can put multiple tiles together. A direct tile to tile link is actually 4.5 terabytes per second, but you can arrange tiles in another big 2D array, just like the cores and just like the D1 chips. The idea is to have units of scale and to keep scaling out. A big 2D mesh of dojo tiles is what we call the dojo system. So in order to enable the off tile communication, each 25 chip tile also has 40 IO controller dies for point to point connectivity. This means a full tile has those included as well, with Tesla saying that the heterogeneous RDL optimized design enables high density and high yield. Included is the extensive power delivery, and it kind of looks like this. And Tesla has already shown one of these tiles up and running on their test system at about 2 GHz. 
You would think that we can now make a large array of dojo tiles, say 10 by 10, and get a, an amazing machine learning supercomputer. However, now we have reached some limit of scale. A Tesla dojo supercomputer actually limits itself based on how quickly it can get data into these chips. In one dimension, that limit is three tiles across. In the other dimension, Tesla have said right now, 40 to 60 is the sweet spot. So you end up with a three by 40 array, and it looks something like this. However, we're still not finished when talking about a dojo supercomputer. If this dojo system is limited to three tiles wide, and at the edge of those tiles are five of the D1, individual D1 chips, the five on the edge of that five by five array, each of those five chips is now connected also to a dojo interface processor or DIP. This is another chip simply for managing the data. The dojo interface processor is a PCIe card that deals with both getting the data into the dojo tile, but also getting data out and moving it around the whole system. Each PCIe card consists of two main chips behind a switch, and each chip is backed by 16 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory or HBM. That memory runs at 400 gigabytes per second, and so each PCIe card with two main chips has 32 gigabytes of HBM at 800 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. It talks to the tile at 900 gigabytes per second with a custom Tesla Transport Protocol Interface, or TDP, such that any data inside the HBM can be transferred to the D1 chip it is connected to at maximum HBM bandwidth. As there are five D1 chips at the edge of every tile, there are five PCIe cards per tile, showcasing a total of 160 gigabytes of HBM per tile edge at 4.5 terabytes per second bandwidth. Each PCIe card can talk to a special switch using that Tesla transport protocol over Ethernet at 50 gigabytes per second. Tesla have developed a custom networking switch and networking protocol to minimize traffic across the Dojo system in a very interesting way called Z-Plane topology. So again, imagine that 3 by 40 Dojo supercomputer I was talking about earlier. Three columns of 40 tiles. You have column 1, column 2, and column 3. Column 1 and column 3 are each connected uh, and each of those 40 tiles are connected to five Dojo interface processors and the stuff with the HBM we were just talking about and each one of those is connected to a special switch with this custom protocol. Now sometimes in a machine learning workload you might need one core to communicate with another core in another tile that are 15 hops away. Without any extra external networking the data would have to go through all the Tesla Dojo tiles and just to get to where it needs to go. Instead, using the Dojo interface processors, the data can leave the tile, go over this external network, and get to the core it needs to in as little as four hops. This allows for multiple routes for data to travel across the network, balancing latency and bandwidth and minimizing congestion. So now we have an idea of a Tesla Dojo supercomputer. Each D1 chip has 354 cores, 25 D1 chips make up a Dojo tile, Tiles are arranged in a 3 wide and 40 long 2D array, and for column 1 and column 3, each tile has 5 interface processors that provide data, and those inter interface processors are connected by a custom dojo switch. Now, each of those dojo switches can also be connected to a more traditional host computer. E you can either connect it to one or to many. In order to do this, again, Tesla has created a special dojo network interface card, or the DNIC, that goes into a PCI slot of your standard computer, so you can communicate to the Dojo supercomputer. This isn't a standard Ethernet card, but you can think of it as a special network card that gives you direct memory access to any one of the 1 million cores on this massive system. What we have here is remote direct memory access for any host that is using a special DNIC to connect to the Dojo switch. The total Tesla Dojo D1 supercomputer is 120 tiles capable of one XOP of BF16 machine learning compute, a total of 1.3 terabytes of onboard SRAM, and a total of 13 terabytes of interface processor HBM. Between the D1 chips, the off-tile I.O. dies, the tile interposer, the interface processor, the switch, and the network card, I'm counting six different pieces of serious network, of serious silicon to make this all work. So you might ask, how does Tesla manage defects or hardware issues? I mentioned that the base D1 chip is tested to be working before it ever gets put in a tile so that it makes the most so it makes sure most manufacturing defects are ironed out before everything gets assembled. 
but even then, an individual D1 chip might end up good enough to use, but with a dead core or three, or the chip on wafer packaging might not be perfect, or something happens during post-packaging that might cause an issue. To get around this, because the system is just one big 2D mesh, the system topology is managed at the software level. Dead nodes are avoided by software, and the routing table for each of those network on chips on each of the D1 dies can be configured not only to avoid dead chips, but also for link balancing and link recovery. Packet ordering is not guaranteed, but packet counting is used in conjunction with system synchronization through semaphores to ensure the atomic atomicity in the cores, as well as avoiding starving cores of data. Feed the beast gets harder as you scale, especially if you can't get data into the cores. This is perhaps why three wide for those tiles strikes a balance with the off tile interface processors with all that H HBM, the high bandwidth memory. So on the software stack, here Tesla is focusing on its own workloads first, its own models, extensions for Dojo and PyTorch, custom JIT neural network compilers with an LLVM backend, drivers, everything going into their own instruction set architecture. That being said, Tesla has said that the instruction set architecture is compiler friendly, and there's a growing need for distributed compiler technology. So in terms of use, I stated that the Tesla Dojo D1 supercomputer, called an Exapod when it hits one exa op, had only one focus when it was designed, to run Tesla's machine learning focused training workloads to a scale not possible with GPUs without significant overhead, significant power cost, or significant time cost. The Dojo design has been meant to solve those three vectors as best as possible. Tesla is focusing on its own self-driving networks, especially convolutional neural networks, and by focusing solely on what they are doing, they are able to cut out some of the extra layers needed by other AI chip companies that want to sell to the cloud or to multiple customers. Tesla has fielded questions multiple times about beyond Tesla use for this, and the answer has been that at some point Tesla could consider building cloud systems for remote use, However, the focus today is simply for getting their own workloads running at scale before they wonder about how to enable non-Tesla use. The idea isn't completely off the table, but it's in the non-Tesla to-do pile, which is low priority. That being said, there is a glimmer of hope. A Dojo XPod can support training multiple networks at once with a disaggregated model system to balance training different training workloads. That means, for example, if multiple customers had instance time on the same machine, it could be split between them depending on what they need. However, again, another caveat, the Tesla Dojo relies on a physical memory addresses rather than virtual memory addresses, making multi-user tenancy almost impossible unless it's all compiled and run at the same time. But the side, but the side benefit of reducing latency, core, core area, and core design complexity through using of physical addresses seems to be worth it. I should point out that if we look at the irreducible units of the system, the minimum viability you need to run anything, you can't simply have just one Dojo D1 chip unless they put it on a PCIe card in the future. The minimum unit of use is going to be a full 25 chip tile, also paired with at least one Dojo interface processor and a host using that Dojo TTP networking protocol. Most AI chips require a host or a source with high DRAM capabilities, you know, including GPUs. But here, there's an extra level of complexity to get a Dojo system up and running. If we compare Dojo to other AI chips in the ecosystem, the only one that's on the same sort of scale here is Cerebrus. And one might argue that Cerebrus's Wavescale engine is he going even more in that direction than Tesla does. While Dojo's traditional individual unit is the D1 chip and we get 25 per tile, Cerebrus just uses one big wafer-sized chip, where a Dojo tile has over 8,500 cores Cerebrus's smallest compute unit has almost a hundred times that. The trade-off is control versus compute. Cerebrus's cores are 50% SRAM, and 850,000 cores are also connected in a 2D mesh, with the lightweight cores enabling stencil compute and not just matrix multiply engines. Cerebrus relies on full chip networking, whereas Dojo has to manage chip-to-chip -chip networking, and as a result, Cerebrus has made engineering strides in what we call cross reticle interconnects, to be able to design a single chip so big. Cerebrus also has redundancy built in, such that if there are any defects in any of those 850,000 cores, based on TSM numbers, there should be about 30 per chip, but Cerebrus says in reality there are a lot less. The software can route around them, le leading to 100% yield. The chip on wafer technology from Tesla, I'd argue, especially with all those Surdes links, is more expensive to produce. 
Tesla has put a lot of work on how the rest of the system is connected and how it communicates with each other. Cerebrus does have its own scale out platform too, up to 192 wafer scale engines at 24 kilowatts each. That's going above Tesla's 120, 120 tiles. However, Cerebrus is selling to dozens of customers today, whereas Tesla has only sell to itself. Cerebrus is already in the market with its second generation hardware and has happy customers. Tesla is still in the process of ramping to its own internal workloads, but we'll find out more at AI Day coming up soon in 2022. So on September 30th, which is only a couple of weeks away when I'm recording this, Tesla is having its AI Day in the Bay Area, where we're expecting to hear more about the Dojo development cycle. I'm reporting today solely on what we've learned from last year's AI Day and the disclosures at Hot Chips a couple of weeks ago. And in the last conference, they did say that some information was being kept back for AI Day, and it sounded like it was about detail, about performance and utility. The funny thing, I'm actually in the Bay Area on that day, and I've been sending out feelers to get an invite to the event. Multiple Tesla employees have told me that the event isn't meant to be a marketing exercise. It's well known that Elon isn't a fan of wide-scale press relations, but the event is meant to be more of a hiring expose. They bring in engineers that might not believe the company is capable of what it can do and gets them to ask, whether question, ask whatever questions they want and, set, and ultimately sell the idea that Tesla, what Tesla does is not only possible, but it's pushing whatever specific industry forward. With that in mind, the event isn't focused at people like me in particular, but I'd still love to get inside to see how the sausage is made. A couple of my contacts have put my name forward for an invite, but I don't have one yet. And short of knowing the people with the invite list or getting a tweet off Elon saying to come on over, I'm crossing my fingers. This isn't a call to action by any means, but I'll have to wait and see. I will add one note about how Tesla is developing its self-driving networks. Right now, it has a lot of customer vehicles in the field, and a lot of those cars, if not all of them, can run those networks in watch or passive mode. It monitors the driving and does all the inference and predictions it would do normally, but nothing happens because the driver is in control. Now, if the driver does something different to what the network thought the driver would do, perhaps because the neural network hasn't seen that situation before, or hasn't been trained on that situation before, or the driver did something really, really wrong, then the video feed leading up to that instant is labeled as an interesting event. Either, either continuously or in batches, Tesla can request those interesting clips back to HQ. Those clips could then be examined, check to see if it really was an interesting event, look at what the algorithm thought was happening, then perhaps be labeled and could be used to train future models, or provide a basis for generating a data set similar to what happened and then use that to train future models. When you have a fleet of vehicles in the field that can do this every day, every hour of every day, terabytes upon terabytes of data can be used to update those models and the cycle repeats. One of the main issues with machine learning, of which there can be many, is simply the volume of good data needed for training. Then again, the question of what is good data, biased or otherwise, is something that technologists, anthropologists, eth ethnicists, Futurologists and even politicians have been debating for years. There's no point training your network on one particular city by one type of middle class driver who can afford these sorts of vehicles and think it will be suitable everywhere in the world where roads are different, signs are different, where the other drivers are different, where even the weather's different, or the hardware may be different due to cost and everything else in between. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this deeper dive into the Tesla Dojo architecture, the chip design, packaging, and system scale out. Each one of these segments could go much, much deeper, or those, those deeper dives should all be partitioned to those particular audiences. If you've got thoughts, comments, corrections, please use the comment section below, and perhaps we'll do an update.